There are several different parameters and actions that you can add to your dynamic block. That means that there may be more than one way to get your dynamic block to respond the way you want it to, and that's okay. Just find the way that works. If it works, it's money, right? So remember to keep it though as simple as you can because the more complex you make it, the more unexpected results and undesired results you might have. But if it's too simple, it just might not work. So remember that. So let's look at some dynamic blocks that are already made that come with AutoCAD. They'll help us understand what we can do with them. Open up your tool palette and let's go to the architectural tab and the toilet. Insert it into your drawing. Now one nice thing about blocks is that once you select them and you right click, you can edit them. It'll open them right up in the block editor. Let's close our tool palette because we don't need it right here. Now this toilet is very simple. It has just a couple of different parameters in it. One of them is a visibility parameter. Now I said earlier that all parameters need actions. Well, visibility is the exception. The visibility, though, does have some other aspects to it. So this is the visibility action. If you select it, you can right-click and you can change some of the grip displays. You can reset the position, turn it off even if you want. And the visibility parameter has different visibility states. Now, we showed you this one earlier in our example. And what it does, it basically just toggles through different drawings. Now your visibility states can be found up here in your block editor contextual ribbon tab right here in the visibility panel. If you click on the visibility states button, you'll get a list of all the different options that there are available to you. We have elongated front, elongated plan, side, etc. Now you can change this order of the lists, moving them up and down. You can even delete some of them. You can rename them. You can make a new one or you can set one as being current. So this is the elongated front. Let's say I wanted the round front. Select it and hit set current and then OK. They don't really look much different. You can also go up here and get to your different ones like this. Just pick the one that you want to look at. Visibility state works this way. In any specific state, certain line work or objects are visible. So it changes the state of visibility, thus the name. So in this state, which is called the elongated front, this is what you see. I can go to any one of these and set them current so that I can edit them. And anything I draw in here now will be edited in this visibility state. I could also add a line, just as an example. And when I switch from the round side to the round plan, you can see that line is gone. So that's nice. This makes it easy to make these changes. Now if I pick an object and I right click on it, I can change the object visibility of it. I can hide it in this current state. I can show it. I can hide it for all states or I can show it for all states, which is what I just picked. So now wherever I go, that line is also going to be there. Now if I delete it here, it's gone everywhere because it was set up to be shown everywhere. So if you want something to be in one specific visibility state, you need to draw it and add it to that current state. So that's the way visibility's states work. We also have in here what's called the flip view. Now the parameter for that is flip. Seems rather obvious, right? And then the action for that is flip. Some of the parameters and some of the actions only go together, like the flip parameter and flip action. So if we were to set up a flip parameter in action, you would first start with your flip and you have to specify a reflection line or that's the line in which it's going to be flipped on. So let's draw it right here. So you pick your first point and you can see that dotted line. It's kind of hard to see. It's not very dark. But I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to make it kind of an angle. And now we put where our flip select button is. It's going to go right there. And you can see this is going to flip it about this line. This parameter needs an action. So we go to the action and we pick flip. Now we select our parameter, which is this one. And now we pick our objects. What are we going to flip? Well, these are just regular lines. And so we can pick them just like you normally would. Anything you don't want to flip, you don't pick it. Press enter. And there you go. The flip is real easy to look at. So that's how you add a flip state to it. When you're all done, you can close the editor. Now, if we go from this 
visibility state to another, you can see that that flip wasn't added to it. It was only in that one visibility state. So visibility states are kind of cool because you can have so many different blocks within one block. Let's close. Save the changes. And here we go. We go to our visibility state. And we need to go to the section we edited, which is right here. This is the round side. We have the standard flip. And we have our flip that we added. Didn't quite work. Well, sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes the process is followed incorrectly. There are a lot of different ways to look at that and to go about fixing it. So when you find out that it's not right, select the block, right click, and go back into the editor. We need to go into a specific setting, which is right here. And you can look at it. You can right click, and we can try to figure out what's going on. And if you can't, then just select it and delete it and redo it. You can try the perimeter sets if you'd like. Sometimes I find them to be even more confusing, but sometimes they can really help out. Let's set our line here again. Specify our location for the flip state. And now you can see it added the parameter and then the action, but there's a problem with the action. Anytime you see that little yellow triangle with the exclamation mark in it, that means something's wrong. Select it, right click, and let's modify the selection by just making a new selection set. Let's pick everything. Make sure to include your parameter in that selection set. And I think that's what we did wrong the last time. Close the block editor. Save changes. And let's go to our new visibility setting. And there we go. Dynamic blocks in their creation can be very tricky because they are very specific on what they need to do. Even the simplest things like just flipping a toilet seat one way or another it has to have a proper procedure followed in its creation. So keep those in mind. Don't get frustrated. Don't think that they're too difficult or impossible to do. Just look at it again and see why it's acting that way. It's kind of like programming. If you were ever done any type of programming, everything has to be exactly right or the computer doesn't understand what you're doing. Well, dynamic blocks are the same way. Now, some of these others can get even more complex. They can use things like constraints and lookup forms. Let's look at one more of these. If we look at the structural tab and we look at the WF beam, insert it, close our tool palette to clear up some space. If I select this here, I have essentially one grip. And this is just for the different sizes or different types of wide flange beams. And it draws it accordingly to the specs. Well, let's look at this and see how complex or simple it might be. Go to the block editor. There's a lot of things in here. Now, this block is using what's called parametric constraints. There's another section that we're going to talk about those in, and we'll really get more in depth in them. Just think of them as dimensions or literal programming for your geometry. We see this depth here of our beam is programmed to 4.173 units, and there's a lock on it. This is a dimensional constraint, which is found right here. We have geometric constraints, which I'll show you. These are different glyphs. This one here means that it's perpendicular. This keeps things horizontal, and this one keeps things parallel. We'll talk about parametric constraints, both geometric and dimensional, later on. But as you can see, there's a lot that goes into this, or that did go into it. This is our lookup table. If I select it and right click, I can look at some of the information on it. I can look at the properties. I can see what's been selected or not selected. Now, a lookup table is a little bit different. And if I click on the block table right here, this gives me some of the information. These are the different dimensions that have been added right here, here, the flange thickness, the radius here, web thickness, etc. And these are their different sizes, their depths, and those values. This lookup table is tied to this grip right here. So if we go to a parameter, I go to a lookup table. It's similar to a visibility table in that it will just show you different sets of data. The visibility is very straightforward. Draw some lines, put in some objects, and you say this is visibility state one. 
Then you go to visibility state two and you add different lines to it. It works, it's very straightforward. Now this lookup table though is different. It creates a table and with it comes sets of data, which you can have in the form of dimensions. So if you have an object like a wide flange beam that has the exact same shape regardless of the type or style of wide flange beam that it is, then it's easy to use a lookup table with. This has several in it, about five or six, and then it will also have a lookup action with it as well. So you need lookup to lookup on the parameters and actions. And then you'll create these dimensions and assign them values like depth, web thickness, flange thickness, the radius, and then the flange width. And then you'll add your lookup table from the actions and you'll just start assigning them values. And once you do all of that, each set of values creates a different option to display your values in. Once you create that lookup table with the different constraints and dimensions, you have your different values here, which act in a way that are similar to the visibility states. The setting I just clicked on applied different height and depth values to our line work. That one is a bit more complex, but once you understand how a lookup table works, it's actually very simple and easy to do. Let's look at one more, and then we'll get on to our chapter project. Let's look at the civil tab and go to the manhole. Now this one's pretty simple. If you look at it here, it has just a manhole cover. It's a ring and it has a series of bolts. If you pick it here, this just scales it up to different radii. That uses the scale action and parameter. We're going to close this tool palette. In order to use the scale action, you don't use a scale parameter. Unlike the flip and the lookup, it just does it. Flip goes to flip and lookup goes to lookup. Well, in this case, if you're going to scale something, you typically need a linear or polar or an XY alignment value. So this is a linear. That makes sense because we're changing this all based on the radius of the manhole. So we add a linear, we put it right here, and we then go to our action of scale. So we add the scale action to it, and you can see the little glyph right there, it's a scale action, and when you hover over it, it tells you what it is. Same case for our linear grip here. And then you just add those parameters. So there are some things that are very straightforward, like the rotation, which would go to from a rotation parameter to a rotate action, or the flip to flip, or the look up to look up. Some of them require some other creativity. You will need a linear stretch for a scale. And then these here are set to specific increments. If you right click on it, you can see your action set, you can modify that. If you open up your properties palette, and you pick your dimension here, you get some options for your value set. You can change it right here to making none. You can see that these little things go away. None, get incremental, or you can generate a list. This one is incremental. You define the distance for the increments right here, and you define a minimum and a maximum. So this is the increment amount. That's the space between here to here. That's three units. So we're increasing the radius by three units every time. The minimum distance is 12, so that's our starting point. And the distance maximum is 240, which goes all the way out here on to the right of my screen. So your properties palette can help you add or change some of your parameters and actions all together there. So keep those in mind, and you can see there's a lot to it. I could probably make an entire video series just on dynamic block creation because there are so many different ways that you can use this. So this is really, unfortunately, just an introduction into dynamic blocks. But as you can see, there's a lot that you can do with them in many different ways.